Hello there. Welcome to another episode of Science and Technology Q&A for kids and others. And uh, I'm happy to talk about all sorts of science and technology topics. If you give me a topic, I'll try and talk about it. Um, it doesn't have to be a specific question. Uh, we're covering lots of topics. I'm, I'm going to concentrate. I've been doing these now for, well, since the beginning of the pandemic. So that's um, almost two years now. Um, and we've got lots of material. Uh, it's available in a variety of forms. We're going to cut it up and um, put it into categories and uh, make these pieces available uh, in, um, uh, in different ways. So if you have topics that you'd like to hear about, happy to talk about them, as I say, as well as specific questions. We have a few things left over here. Uh, a lot of these are rather high level. Um, and although I'm happy to talk about high level things, I'm uh, um, hoping to keep what I'm doing here accessible to a wide range of folk. Um, let's see. Well, we had a question here saved up from Aaron about uh, making the internet traceable and untraceable. Well, let's, let's talk about that for a minute. So, uh, sort of some basics about how the internet works. When you tell your computer to, uh, for example, your web browser, you say you type in your web browser, wolframalpha.com, what actually happens? What happens is your web browser has to know how to send the request that it makes to wolframalpha.com. Wolframalpha.com is a server somewhere. In that particular case, I know where the servers are. We have uh, several uh, data centers um, around, around the country, actually, um, that uh, uh, are computers that will respond to requests to wolframalpha.com. But so how does that actually work? So you type wolframalpha.com in your web browser and your computer has to then make that request to one of the computers that is the, a wolframalpha.com server. How does that work? So the first thing that happens is this thing called DNS, domain name server lookup, where you have to resolve what is wolframalpha.com? What, uh, what is its internet address? And what is the route that allows you to go from your computer through the whole network of computers that comprise the internet to a computer that is a wolfram.com or a wolframalpha.com computer. So the first thing that happens is you make a request to a DNS server. Um, actually, often the routing information is cached, uh, is kept temporarily on your computer or on your local network. And that allows your computer to, to immediately send that request out without having to go look up where, how is that request supposed to get routed? But assume you had never gone to wolframalpha.com before, um, then it would have to go and figure out how does it get to wolframalpha.com. It looks it up through this domain name server system. Um, that system is also, uh, there's a whole kind of series of, of levels of that system eventually going to, I think it's 13 root name servers around the world that are the ultimate sort of authorities on where the routes to different places, how, how you get to certain named domains on the internet. Um, and, and usually what happens is if, if, for example, let's say some data center goes down and so the, you want to change the, how you get to this particular service, you have to propagate new routes through the internet you have to, and that takes, I don't know, 10 minutes or something to happen as you say, well, actually, wolframalpha.com is now some different IP address, some different route, and that has to be something that is sort of uh, uh, propagated back so that when people request that address, in the, in, uh, it will give the new potential address. Okay, so let's say you're computer successfully manages to send its request to a server at whatever it is, wolframalpha.com, for example. What does the server, what does the computer, the wolframalpha.com computer, 
What does it know about the request that's coming in? Well, one thing it knows is the IP address of your computer originating that request, so to speak. So, uh, so whenever a request comes in to, for example, a web server, HTTP, HTTPS server, um, one of the pieces of information that's passed along with that request is what the originating IP address was, the originating internet protocol address was. Um, and so that is something where when, when you go to a website, the website will know at the very minimum the IP address of the computer that you made that request from. Now, one of the things that people can be interested in doing is somehow hiding their IP address. And there are a variety of ways to do that. Um, a pretty common one is to use VPN, virtual private network, and to go to a place where many people will be going to the same kind of pooled computer. And then all the requests uh, that, that go into that computer come out looking as if they're coming from that same computer. So for example, I don't know, there might be a, uh, a computer in, I don't know, pick a place, um, Chicago or something, um, that is the end point for, for VPNs for people to connect their computer through a virtual private network. So their computer is, is communicating just with this computer, let's say in Chicago, and um, then any request that they make to a website goes through that computer in Chicago. And so the request will look as if it's coming from that computer in Chicago rather than from their own computer. And the connection that they make between their own computer and the computer in Chicago is through this virtual private network, which is sending uh, encrypted data uh, back and forth. Um, I mean, that, that's, that's also done for uh, when you use a website that has an HTTPS address, that's also using encrypted data going from your computer to that website. But the website, if the website wants to know sort of who's looking at it, um, it can still detect the IP address of, it still knows the IP address of the originating computer unless you go through some sort of pooled computer. So then there are more elaborate schemes um, one of the more elaborate schemes is, is uh, Tor, I, the, the onion router. Um, it was developed, when was it? Maybe 20 years ago, 15 years ago. It was originally developed, um, uh, people say it was um, originally developed by the US military um, as kind of a, okay, you've got some, somebody out in the field somewhere who's trying to report all kinds of secret information and um, you don't want it to be clear where that information is coming from, who's sending it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is sort of a mechanism for that. Um, and uh, it's, it's a general way to kind of hide uh, sort of traffic that's going on on, on the internet. So the, the way it works is, is this, if I can, uh, I think I can describe it. Um, what happens is I mentioned, you know, you go from your computer to some uh, sort of pooled relay computer somewhere through VPN and then out to whatever website you're going to visit. But you can do that in many hops. You can do something where instead of just going to one intermediate computer, you go to through 10 intermediate computers and they're bouncing all over the world. And in the end, you go and, and, and you don't even know what computers your, your, your request is going through. And at the end, there is some sort of exit node where that the computers, the, 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 the packets, the, the requests that are coming look as if they're coming just from that, that final last step in the chain of places where requests are going. And, and so there are people, uh, I don't quite know who does this, but um, uh, it seems like a very um, uh, scary thing to do, but there are people who, who uh, provide um, nodes for the Tor network and particularly exit nodes. And so that they, any, when people connect to the Tor network, they're going through, I don't know how many it is, you know, 10 different computers. And eventually their request will get to a random exit node from which they will then go and make a request to a website. And that's some, um, there are other pieces of that network that 
have to do with uh, websites, sort of web-like sites that, that are not part of the standard internet, uh, accessible from the standard internet, but that's a, that's a separate kind of thing. The, the, the question is, if you're sort of going through the, the um, if you're using the web, for example, what information do you get? Does, does the website you're going to visit get about you? Now, there's lots of other kinds of information a website can get, uh, particularly when your web browser, so, so normally you're in the most simple kind of version of a website, the website is just, what comes back to your browser is just HTML. So it's just a kind of a plain description of, oh, there's this uh, header type, there's this font color, there's this characters, there's these characters, it, and, and maybe there's this specification of image or something like this. It's very direct kind of uh, sort of word processor-like information about what the page should look like. But many years ago now, this language called JavaScript was introduced that web browsers understand. And so what can happen is that the page that comes back to you isn't just something like a page of text. It also contains essentially pieces of programs, JavaScript programs, and your browser, uh, unless you switch it off, can run JavaScript programs. And those JavaScript programs can themselves do things from your computer that make further requests uh, to, uh, to, to, the, um, um, uh, to, to, the, to the server that is serving up information from the web. And so in principle, th these things are sandboxed in the sense that those requests, those JavaScript requests get access to only very specific information about your computer and your web browser and so on, and that's all they can send. But there are many, well, there are just all kinds of different, different complicated ways that things get stored on your computer. Another whole issue is cookies. Uh, when you go and visit a website, the website can put what's called a cookie in your web browser. And uh, a cookie in this context is not an edible thing, except by web browsers, I suppose. Um, it's just a, a bunch of information that says, this website put this data in your web browser. And sometimes cookies are set to expire. So it's like, this will only be uh, something that's valid for an hour, but they could be valid for, I think, what is the limit? Maybe a hundred years or something. They, they could be permanently stored on your computer and permanently valid. What are those cookies? They're things like, here's the login information for this website. So. You go to the website once, you type your username, your password, all that kind of thing. Then the website will send back a cookie that is stored in your web browser so that when you next visit that website, instead of you having to type your login information again, it will just use the information that that, that website stored in your web browser telling you, tell it, that you can then send back to the web browser. And it says, oh yes, I know that person. I've seen them before. I know that they logged in on this website before. So, so I can tell that it's okay to let them in. Um, but often there will be many, many, many cookies that are put from websites onto, onto your, into your web browser that contain all kinds of information about what did you do on that website? Oh, the person was looking at buying shoes or something. So let me put some cookie information so that when they next come back, um, we show them shoes rather than something else. Um, and also, as soon as there's a, a cookie that uh, came from logging in, then it's known sort of who you are every time you go and visit that website. There's a lot of complication about uh, kind of sort of exchanging cookies between websites. And there's a lot of complexity to do with delivering ads and ad networks and what kinds of cookies are shared between different uh, uh, different companies effectively um, because they're going through ad networks that correspond to a particular domain. The way a web browser works, it, the cookies are separated by the domain from which the cookie was provided. So the, the cookies that, I, we don't use very many cookies, but the very minimal cookies that Wolfram.com, for example, will put, I think they're mostly login cookies, um, that will, will put on into your web browser um, 
are different from the cookies that, I don't know, uh, you know, apple.com will put into your web browser and, and Apple, the apple.com server can't request cookies from wolfram.com and vice versa. Um, but if you're using some kind of ad network where it's where the ads are being served from a single domain that is the same across lots of different uh, users of that, then, then that story doesn't really work anymore. And there are all kinds of other elaborate uh, cross-site scripting attacks and all this kind of thing. There's a, it's sort of remarkable that these systems that get built, which are typically built sort of because, well, it was convenient for users to have this or that feature. Um, somebody figures out some way to exploit those features to do something that users probably don't want them to do. And by the way, when in terms of what information is sent by your web browser to uh, to a website, for example, for example, your web browser will say what version of the web browser it, it is. It will also typically say things about screen size. Um, it'll say, um, uh, I think it has a language encoding. Um, and for example, the screen size is important for the web browser, for the web server, because if you're on a tiny screen, you get sent a version of the website the, that um, has uh, all its data kind of stacked up so that it will fit on a small screen. Uh, whereas if, you, if the specification is, well, you have a wide screen, then it will send you the information in a different format. And that's the, the, the typical concept that something has been really popular for probably five years or more is so-called responsive design, where a website will change the way it looks depending on what uh, um, uh, what what the uh, you know what the sort of size and shape of the um, of the of the window in which it's being displayed is, and sometimes that kind of information can be represented directly in kind of the the code that's sent back to represent the website and the particularly CSS code on the website, um, and but sometimes it requires the server the the web server sending different information to specify what to do on a different shape of screen. So that's a, boy, this is, I, I actually didn't realize how complicated this was. I can, I can go to many more layers of detail here, but, but perhaps that's a, um, some indication of what, um, uh, what kind of thing is, um, is sent from your web browser to a computer um, and a uh, little bit on kind of how sort of privacy preserving uh, mechanisms work um, things like um, uh, there's there's uh, the, there's a variety of different methods for making things like this Tor network that I mentioned. There's a blockchain outfit called NKN that um, uh, I've been a bit involved with. That that um, I was kind of pleased that they made use of a bunch of science that I've done. Um, I wrote this big book called The New Kind of Science nearly 20 years ago now. Uh, whose abbreviation is NKS, New Kind of Science, and this network's abbreviation is, uh, this blockchain's abbreviation is NKN for New Kind of Network. Um, and its way of working is kind of uh, something where you have many computers and you're sending, uh, uh, you're sending packets of information between these computers, uh, much as the internet sends packets of information between computers, but in this case, the way it works is there's a cryptocurrency effectively that is being used to essentially pay people to have traffic go through their computers um, and, uh, and that that's the way that it will be transmitted. And by having enough computers, I forget how many they have now, a few hundred thousand, I think. By having enough computers and the traffic is, is routed sort of randomly between those computers, it's, it's hard to tell what went where and that's a, a way to preserve kind of the privacy of things. It's also advantageous potentially to say, well, if somebody has a really fast way to route traffic and you can essentially pay them to, uh, through cryptocurrency to route your, your traffic through their computer or through their piece of some network, and that's um, uh, a way that uh, you can kind of get a faster internet and so on. Well, let's see. Um, the question here, um,
There's a question from Aaron. Can I describe how packets get dropped um, in, okay, in the internet? All right, so this is a complicated story and I don't completely know the answer to this. And I've wondered about this myself. When, so in computer networks, when you are sending data to, from one computer to another, the data is sort of packaged up into packets. So it's usually, not always, but there are some other cases where it doesn't quite work like this, but usually instead of just sending a long string of, of you know, millions of bits of data, you send these packets of data that have a certain length, I don't know, 2000 bits or something like this. And so you'll send one packet, you wait for it to be delivered, maybe you, and, well, you'll, you'll send packets in some sequence. And one of the things that can happen is, depending on what route those packets take, even though you had sent them out in order one, two, three, four, five, they may not arrive in that order. And so when they arrive, the thing that's, that's receiving them has to potentially reorder them. So some protocols for sending things through, uh, through computer networks actually have some mechanism to tell the the, the computer that sent the packet, yes, this packet arrived, maybe send another one, or no, this packet didn't arrive, resend that same packet. So for example, the TCP protocol, which is uh, the protocol used underneath um, HTTP is, um, is, a, is a protocol that has this feature that it has a response where it, where it sends back um, the information. So it sends back sort of a receipt that yes, the packet arrived or resend that packet and so on. For example, the UDP protocol, which is the one used for streaming video and things like this, does not have that feature um, so far as I know. And uh, it, it, uh, so that's something where if you are sending out video, it's more important that you send the video out and that it get received than if, if there's a little glitch and some video gets dropped, well, that's a little bad, but not terrible if you're trying to send some program or some text file or something and something got dropped, that's much worse. And that's why TCP protocol is usually the thing used for that. Now, in terms of why packets get lost, the, when you send these packets of information, usually you will see, well, all the packets went through. So for example, you can use some, uh, um, well, ping is one, one way to do it where you say, Ping is sending one packet of information, uh, maybe just 256 bytes perhaps, uh, from your computer to some remote computer, and the remote computer will sort of echo it back, use a different protocol. I think that's using uh, ICMP, if I remember correctly. It's a, it's a different protocol from TCP and UDP. It's a specific protocol for ping, where it's like, this is a test. Is your computer actually connected to another computer, uh, to some specific other computer? you're sending out from your computer, you send um, and the other computer is then sort of uh, set up to respond to that, that ping and send back uh, something saying, yes, I received it. And so one often talks about ping time, which is the time that it takes, the round trip time that it takes for the packet to get sent to the remote computer and then come back to you. So for example, it might be you know, a short ping time might be 100 milliseconds, 0.1 seconds. Uh, long ping times might be a second or more. And eventually, uh, if the ping time is too long, if it takes too long for the packet to come back, um, it will time out. And many kinds of services that sort of try and communicate between computers, if, if those times are too long, they'll just time out and they'll say, sorry, you can't connect to this other computer uh, adequately to run this particular kind of service. But you quite often see a certain amount of packet loss in when you are seeing uh, um, packets that are sent through ping through the internet. Um, and you see uh, even in a local network, when you have computers connected uh, through wires or fiber optics locally, you'll still see some amount of packet loss. What causes packet loss? Well, there are a variety of different mechanisms. But one very obvious mechanism, uh, for example, on a local network is uh, that, uh, for example, Ethernet, common protocol for a local network, um, it 
okay, so you have one computer that wants to send a packet. So it just says, okay, I'm going to send this packet. What does that actually mean? If it's sending it on an electrical wire or something, it means it's going to have some voltage that it uh, puts on that wire and it's going to have, uh, it's going to sort of um, uh, send through this signal that is based on voltage spikes on the wire. Okay, so the computer says, well, I want to do that right now. But another computer says, well, I want to do that right now as well. Most of the time, if the computers, if there aren't, if the total number of packets being sent is a, a tiny fraction as it usually is of the total amount of time. So most of the time, computers are not sending packets back and forth between each other. It's just, well, when you press that key to say, I wanna go look at that website, or when you're getting data back from that website, those kinds of things, then there is data being sent through the network. But most of the time, your computer isn't particularly sending data through the network. So the way that ethernet, for example, works is it assumes that most of the time there won't be, there won't be very many computers trying to communicate through this network and so on. And so what happens is it just says, okay, computer, you know, whenever you want to send data, just send this packet through. Okay, well, the problem is if another computer happened to send a packet through at the exact same time, there'd be a collision and the whole thing would get munged and nothing good would come out. Uh, the, the, the sort of the electrical signal would sort of get nastily combined together and you wouldn't get a useful thing out. So what then happens is, I think in ethernet, it has exponential back off, which means it will send a packet, something bad happens, we'll try and send the packet again in let's say a second. And then if something bad happens again, it'll wait two seconds. Something bad happens again, it'll wait four seconds. It'll keep doubling the amount of time that it waits to send another packet through. And so, but, and it sort of hopes that eventually things will clear out and it'll be successful at sending a packet through. But it's kind of a random thing. And if the total amount of traffic on the network gets high enough, it's sort of inevitably the case that just by random chance, a bunch of these packets will collide with each other. And so you will get packet loss um, as a result of the packets just munging each other through being trying to sort of send electrical signals through the same wire at the same time. So that's a, a typical example of packet loss. Another example of packet loss, somewhat different cause, is for cell phones and things where you're sending electrical, you're sending uh, radio signals from a cell phone tower to a cell phone. And uh, there will be, uh, you know, you're transmitting that radio and you're walking around and, and you know, trees are swaying in the wind and the radio is, is the radio waves are, are going, uh, going sort of through that environment. Sometimes some amount of, uh, radio signal will be attenuated, will be absorbed by a tree or something like this, because you happen there happen to be a tree there, or or alternatively, in a, in a somewhat more subtle way, there are multiple channels of radio being used by effectively different users of the network, and so things can happen with one user's uh, uh, sort of the the interference between what happens from from data from one user and another, more or less. Um, but again, in that case, there can be packet loss associated purely with the, the, uh, the fact that a radio signal was sent and it wasn't received. You know, if it's raining, for example, you can get all kinds of packet loss of, uh, of, of radio signals and things like this. So that's another type of packet loss. Um, I think there are, uh, there are forms of packet loss that happen on the internet um, that are, uh, mostly I suspect have to do with timing things very similar to ethernet of things arriving at the same time. Some, some, um, uh, some router says, oh, I got these two packets at the same time. I, I've only got one wire to route them out over. I've got to reject one of these packets, uh, those kinds of things. Um, I think that, uh, uh, yeah, people, I haven't heard this for a long time, but maybe, oh gosh, when was it? 25 years ago or more, people were talking about internet storms, which were kind of places where for various reasons, so many packets had accumulated in that place and that uh, everything got kind of gummed up. I remember a long time ago, I worked on, um, uh, on a parallel computer that had 65,000 processors and it had the problem of routing information 
sending information from one processor to another. And one of the issues was it had only a limited number of wires that would connect these processors together. It was effectively, it had uh, every processor was connected directly to 16 other processors, I think. And um, there was all uh, arranged in this, in this sort of giant um, hypercube of, uh, of, you know, as far as the connections were concerned, hypercube of 65,000 processors. And that, uh, and the question was, if you wanted to send a signal from this place to that place, um, which, which wires would you use? And then what would happen if too many signals arrived at the same place at the same time, and there was a fixed size of buffer that would be allow you to, to store um, the, uh, uh, to store sort of packets that were waiting to be sent out or uh, data that was waiting to be sent out. And if that overflowed, um, you would lose data there. So that's another example of um, uh, a kind of um, uh, way, that, way that data gets lost in, in networks. Um, I think the, uh, so it's, it's all a little bit mysterious and you can see in different places, different situations, you'll see different amounts of packet loss. If you, um, um, I don't know, in, in um, uh, I like to uh, walk around where I am and I, I have um, a kind of a, a, um, a walk around outside when it isn't too cold outside. Um, and uh, I've, I've often chased kind of packet loss of various kinds um, that is associated with literally sort of physical distance to a transmitter or um, uh, or various kinds of vegetation in the way and things like this. It's it's very um, gets very kind of practical. And, and when people are setting up cell phone systems, for example, there's this whole question of where do you put the cell phone towers so that you get good coverage, to, uh, independent of whether there are leaves on the trees and whether this is happening and that's happening. Uh, what, how do you make sure you get good coverage in all places? And it's it's often tricky to figure out where should you put these cell phone towers and then you have to get somebody to agree to let you put a cell phone tower on a building or in a piece of land in some particular place and, and so on. And it's, it's, uh, uh, it's quite a, a challenging, essentially engineering and mathematical problem to figure out where do you put the cell phone towers to get the best uh, coverage and so on. Well, let's see. Um, there's a question here uh, from uh, Raj uh, about limitations of Moore's law. Well, so I, first of all, I have to explain what Moore's law is. Um, so it's always been, people always think computers get faster. The engineering of computers gets better. And Moore's law was a kind of a, an observation from Gordon Moore, founder of Intel, um, that said, let's see, computer speed, what is it? Doubles every 18 months, is that right? I think that's the right, uh, right, right uh, uh, numerical version. But the, this was something back from the 1960s, 70s and so on. Uh, people managed to make computers go faster. And how did they do that? Well, from the time microprocessors were first developed, the big issue had to do with things like how fast could you run, how fast could you run signals through the microprocessor and not have the signals uh, kind of uh, die off, get attenuated, not have the signals interfere with each other, and so on. So it's a question when you have a computer, it has ultimately a CPU chip that has maybe these little tiny features that are etched on it effectively with photolithography that correspond to maybe these days hundreds of millions or a billion transistors or more. And those represent the circuit that is implementing your computer, that is your computer. And when the computer runs, there is a, a clock. There's a, you're, you're saying uh, every that there's an instruction that runs now, there's an instruction that runs the next instruction, next instruction, next instruction. And that clock these days usually sort of ticks about 2 billion times a second, maybe 3 billion times a second. So it's a two gigahertz, three gigahertz um, clock. And that says every time at every tick of the clock, you um, are sort of executing a new instruction in your computer CPU. What does it mean to execute a new instruction? Well, it means all sorts of electrical signals have to go from one part of the uh, part of the microprocessor chip to another part and so on. And there's a question of sort of 
how fast can all of that happen? And how, what sort of frequency can you use to, to sort of send signals through that, through that microprocessor? And that in turn is affected by uh, how, how big the wires are effectively. They're not actual wires, they're formed, they're, they're channels where there is essentially electrical conductivity that's formed by etching out pieces of, of a, a piece of, uh, of silicon basically. Um, and uh, those are very tiny kind of uh, etched channel. And the question is how big is that channel? And that determines kind of how fast the signal that uh, how, how fast the signal can change as it goes through that channel. And so as uh, the, the, the widths of those channels, for example, have gradually been, uh, been decreasing um, these days, I think, what is the state of the art? Four nanometers maybe? Um, the, uh, that means um, uh, um, four billionths of a meter. So that's about the size of, um, oh, maybe that's 40, 50 atoms across, something like that. Um, the, um, so that's, a, uh, that's the size of this effective wire. And as that gets smaller and smaller, you're able to make things go faster and faster. Well, that was the story for quite a long time, that people, it was very tricky to make uh, these microprocessors have these smaller and smaller features, and it required more and more careful manufacturing. You know, if you have a piece, a speck of dust anywhere there, it's like super bad news, just, just blows away some, you know, that, that, uh, that particular CPU chip is like hopeless, can't be used if, the, if a speck of dust landed in the wrong place at some moment. Then there are things like, how do you actually etch a feature that's that small? You can't even use visible light to do that because visible light kind of, the light waves are kind of too big and bulky to actually be able to image something that small. So you have to use ultraviolet light or X-rays to do that. That's all complicated engineering. You have to make sure that all kinds of things don't happen when you have to have very, very uh, perfect silicon crystals to start off making your microprocessor chip out of, because if there's a, a defect in the silicon crystal, if all the silicon atoms aren't lined up perfectly right, then that will make a place where the chip won't behave the way it was supposed to behave and so on. And then there are tricks like, well, if you're making, let's say a memory chip, where there are a lot of identical elements, you can say, well, I'm gonna just make a billion elements on this chip, and I'm gonna know that 1% of those elements won't work because there'll be some defect in the silicon crystal or there'll be some other, some other issue. And so then you, you make that billion element uh, uh, memory chip and then you test every element in it and you just set it up so that it has a, um, a sort of memory on the memory chip of which elements of the memory chip actually work. And it, it only sends data to those elements that work. It has something that is translating addresses so that it only sends data to the elements that work. So that's a, the, the whole series of tricks which, which uh, have been sort of developed over the course of, of 50 years or more, um, making progressively faster microprocessor circuits. And this worked pretty well until maybe 10, 15 years ago now. For a long time, people were saying, eventually we're gonna get to a gigahertz, we're gonna have a billion instructions per second, a, a clock frequency of a, of a, of a a billion cycles per second and so on. And then that was achieved. And then people said, well, we're gonna go faster than that. But actually, for example, clock frequencies have not increased that much in the last 10 years of typical, you know, if you go to your computer and you, you go to the sort of about this computer tab, it will tell you things like the clock frequency of your computer. And it might be two gigahertz, 2.5 gigahertz, something like that. Um, you, you don't see it advancing up to, you know, 10 gigahertz, 50 gigahertz, things like this. And so, this kind of exponential increase of, of sort of the raw speed of microprocessors kind of slowed down. And, and for example, I know we, we just got new servers for uh, Wolfram Alpha and uh, our previous servers have been 10 years old. And I was a little disappointed that things didn't get super much faster when we got these new servers. Um, they, they got a bit faster for reasons that were not specifically to do with the servers themselves that had to do with memory configurations and so on. I should say that among the other, so, so one question is what's the sort of raw speed of the microprocessor? Then you start getting into, well, 
What you actually care about is the speed of programs you run on the microprocessor. And so then there are all kinds of other engineering things you can do to make the effective speed of programs you run be faster. So for example, one very uh, common one is so-called memory hierarchy idea. So the point is that when you're doing operations on your CPU, then you might say, well, I'm gonna add this number to that number. Okay, where did you store those numbers? Did you store those numbers in a place that was really fast for the CPU to get those numbers from so that it can do the addition and get the result in, uh, you know, in, in uh, a billionth of a second or something? Or does it somehow have to fetch the data for each of those numbers from further away from, uh, from kind of a, a slower kind of storage? And so the idea of the memory hierarchy is that you can have things like a level one cache, a level two cache, L1 cache, L2 cache, and so on. You have these different kinds of local storage of things that are progressively store more, but are slower. So like the level one cache will be, uh, will be just a, a, I don't know how much, how big they are these days, um, maybe a few kilobytes of data um, that uh, are stored extremely much close to the place where the operations are done in the CPU and they're very fast memory, very easily accessible. And so if the thing that you are trying to compute with is in that L1 cache, then you can do it really fast. If it was, well, it wasn't, we didn't know you were going to compute with that and it's all the way out in the main memory of your computer that can take many clock cycles to go fetch that data from the main memory of your computer, bring it into the place where it can actually be operated on by, by your CPU. And so one of the things that then happens is, can you be predictive? Can you figure out uh, what, what data you're going to need before you actually need it. Can you do that, for example, by analyzing the program that is being run on the computer? Can you even do it by, for example, one thing you can do is if, if there are two branches that the code could take, you could actually uh, start fetching the data for both branches, even though you don't yet know which branch the code is actually going to take. So that's another trick. And so there's, a, there's just more and more and more of these clever tricks to do with uh, sort of how you manage sort of getting the data to the right place at the right time so that it can be effectively faster to operate on even though the CPU didn't get any faster. Well, the other thing that's a big issue is you write a program in, I don't know, Wolfram Language, in C, in Java, whatever else, eventually that's gonna have to get turned into the machine code of your computer. Eventually your computer has a fixed number of opcodes that say things like add two numbers together, store this piece of data in memory in this location, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are, these are the machine code operations of your computer. Eventually, everything you do has to be translated into that machine code. And the question is, given a particular operation you want to do, what's the most efficient machine code that does that operation you want to do? So you have some program you've written. How is that program most efficiently turned into machine code? And again, there has been a lot of development in how best to do that. Uh, even an example is, well, optimizing compilers is one type of thing where there's a question of, well, there are many possible ways that you could do this particular operation in machine code. There are many possible machine code programs that will execute the same operations when you look at it at a high level, let's say a level of Wolfram language, it's a very high level, or even at the level of C code, which is very close to sort of just a more human readable version of the kind of things that are directly uh, done by a computer in, them, in its machine code. And so there are things that seem at first quite crazy, like you could say, well, let's just take the instructions that, um, uh, let's just do a random search for programs or for orderings of instructions in programs to just see uh, in, the, in this random search, most of the randomly arranged or randomly searched for programs won't do the right thing at all. They'll just do something completely crazy. But every so often you'll find a program that is, yes, it does exactly what I want. And you might not have figured out by sort of thinking about it in an engineering way, well, you could do this instruction and then this one, and that will have the data ready in this place and so on and so on and so on. But by doing even just this random search, you can often find these super clever if you look at them, clever and often kind of incomprehensible 
ways in which the computer can say, yep, I can do it, I can do it faster there. So that's another example of how it's been possible to sort of tweak the speed of things. Well, there are really two frontiers of being able to make things go faster. One is at the level of software, and the other is at the level of, well, I guess that it's sort of they, they, they merge into each other. One of the issues is if you have a, a piece of code, it's written in a language like C, it's written in, uh, the, the, it, it just sort of specifies what a computer can do, should do, a standard computer should do. But let's say that you know that a big, op, big thing for you to want to do in your programs is take an array of numbers and uh, add it to another array of numbers, let's say. Add the corresponding numbers in the two arrays. Let's say that was an operation you, you commonly want to do. Or you want to do some operation where you take two arrays of numbers and you multiply the corresponding numbers and add the results up, a, a dot product in, in linear algebra. So let's say you know you really want to do those operations a lot. Well, then you can actually make special purpose hardware that is specially set up. So it has all of its memory arranged and it has maybe many uh, parallel uh, units that all do addition of numbers and they all operate in parallel across this whole long array, this long register that contains all these different numbers and so on. You can set that up all in the hardware that of your kind of microprocessor. And so that's most of the story of GPUs, graphics processing units, um, is that what's been done is it's been sort of noticed that there are these particular operations, particularly operations on arrays of numbers, which are commonly things you want to do. They're things you want to do in doing computer graphics. They're things you want to do in processing video. They're things you want to do these days in some kinds of machine learning operations. There are particular operations that are sort of common lumps of computational work that you want to do. And so then the idea is to make pieces of hardware that are as efficient as possible at doing those things. Now it's then challenging if you've got, well, I want to just do this, run this program that I just made up from scratch. Well, there's no guarantee that that program that you made up from scratch will, will, will kind of correspond nicely to the things that are sort of efficient to do with a GPU. And so that's sort of a, uh, it will be, as it, it's less easy to convert the programs you have to GPU programs than it is to convert the, the programs you have, sort of every programming language is set up to be able to be converted to the ordinary machine code of a CPU, it's a more specialized thing to convert to, for example, a GPU. So one thing that can happen is some operations like playing a video or something like that can get dramatically faster because they're things where they are uh, sort of specifically using the things that have been implemented in hardware in, for example, a GPU, whereas sort of your general operation that was just an arbitrary computer algorithm won't get particularly faster because it's just using the standard instructions and standard opcodes and so on, which are not kind of set up to be specifically the GPU kinds of, kinds of operations. So it's a little confusing when you look at, you know, benchmarks of computers and it's sort of a question, well, what do you want to do with the computer? Um, that will determine uh, sort of the effective speed of the computer. And, and if you look, you know, like we have these Wolfram Mark things for, for Wolfram language, which are sort of benchmarks on different kinds of computers. And we try to sort of spread out the things that are done to do that testing for, across different kinds of operations, things that access memory a lot, things that do a lot of things that can be done inside GPUs, things that cannot be done in GPUs and so on to sort of spread it out to give you some rough approximation to quotes typical usage um, of, uh, of your computer through Wolfram language. But there's, there's in a sense, there's no typical because it depends on what you're trying to do. Okay, so that's on that side. Now on the other side, it's the question of, well, can you make the actual raw hardware of the computer faster? And the basic technology of computer microprocessors of making uh, things out of silicon and so on, that's pretty much been the same since, well, really the 1960s, um, but gradually uh, sort of tweaked with more and more cleverer and cleverer engineering solutions to things. Um, there's a question of, is there sort of a fundamentally faster way to do computation? And one of the things that actually, well, science that I've done strongly suggests is that you can do computation with almost anything. There's this thing I call the principle of computational equivalence, which says that any, pretty much any system whose behavior isn't obviously simple 
will be capable of doing computation as sophisticated as, as anything else. So if you just have something which is some very simple rule, you have, let's say, an array of black and white dots. That's something I've studied a whole bunch. Um, and you just have some rule that says, uh, depending on locally, which black and white dots are next to each other, update the, the, the sequence in this way. Just with rules like that, you can make a universal computer. You can make something which is computationally as sophisticated as anything. But present day computers are always based on the specific idea of representing uh, kind of data through the presence of electrons in a semiconductor and having sort of operations be represented by gates that are made by having voltages in semiconductors and, and, and currents of electrons going through semiconductors and so on. Very specific piece of physics that's used to actually set up computers as they have existed for the last 50 years or more. Now, in the early days of computers, people had all kinds of experiments they tried about, can we store memory for computers in, I don't know, one of the more exotic ones, which was used, was uh, mercury delay lines, where you would have uh, liquid mercury, uh, like in an old, very old fashioned thermometer, um, or um, you'd, uh, uh, and you would have a essentially a loudspeaker that would be playing sound through this mercury tube. And the sound is, is causing compression and, uh, and rarefaction waves in the mercury. And it'd be going through this tube and you'd be recycling that sort of sound. So, so in a sense, you're storing information by the fact that there's this delay in, you know, you, you play sound at one end of the mercury tube and it takes, I don't know, some number of hundreds of milliseconds or something to get to the other end of the mercury tube. And then you go and cycle it back again. And that kind of continual recycling of, in that case, sound waves was used to store persistent information. Well, that particular method absolutely went, went away. Um, and then there were many different methods. There was a core memory was an early method where you would have a essentially tiny magnets. And depending on whether the magnets were magnetized in one direction or the other direction, that would store a one or a zero bit. Bunch of different schemes. And so as we think about sort of the future of computers, we can think about, well, what kinds of physics could we use to store information? And so a lot of the work that is done in quantum computing is all about different and often quite exotic methods of storing bits of information and then doing operations on those bits of information. And there are different sort of different kinds of physics that you can imagine using, whether it involves superconductors, whether it involves uh, kind of microwave cavities, whether it involves different kinds of things, where the goal is always the same thing, that you need something where you're storing, you can store bits of information and a way in which you can have those bits of information interact. Now, I suspect that there are many, many ways to do this. And in fact, I, you know, I strongly believe from the science that I've done that there are just a huge number of ways to do this uh, and that you can sort of piggyback on almost any physical system to make something computational. The challenge is usually preparing the particular computation you want to do and then reading out the result. You know, when you have, let's say a, a fluid water that's, uh, uh, you know, all turbulent and, and uh, in, uh, moving in very complicated ways, that's doing a computation. The problem is, can you specify that you want this particular computation of working out the nth prime number or something being done by that, by that fluid? And then if the fluid does the computation, can you read out the answer? That's more challenging than the actual process in many ways of doing the computation itself. So the sort of a question of what methodologies will be found, what technologies, what systems will be found convenient to, uh, to actually uh, do, the, do computation with. And so for example, one thing I've actually been studying recently is doing computation with individual molecules and doing these operations like storing a bit in the state of a molecule, having these operations be done by interaction between two molecules, by essentially chemical interaction between two molecules, or at least electrical interaction between two molecules, and so on. And so that, that's really the, the, the question and the challenge is what, what physical processes can one use to do computation? And right now we're down to, I don't know what it is these days, maybe mm, a few tens of thousands of electrons per bit um, in, in typical uh, modern semiconductor devices and so on. And so there's a question, could you get it down to one electron per bit? 
probably couldn't get it lower than that because electrons are sort of the, the you know, that, that's sort of a, those, those are elementary particles um, uh, in our current theory of physics, we think that they are things that have structure, but the structure is unbelievably tiny compared to anything that we are, uh, uh, that we deal with in, in sort of everyday physics that we can manipulate. It's trillions and trillions and trillions of times smaller than that structure is than the actual uh, size of things that we can manipulate directly ourselves. But so the question will be, can you get down the kind of storage of information to a single electron or a single kind of other particle. That's kind of the minimum that we have any hope of being able to manipulate with current physics technologies. Um, and uh, one of the issues then is by the time you're at that level of smallness, all sorts of effects of quantum mechanics and so on start being really important. And in quantum mechanics, it's kind of like, well, it, it isn't the case that we can say the particle definitely did this thing. We said there are many paths the particle could have followed, and we only know the probabilities for those different paths. We, because of the way that we measure things, just like we are not sensitive to where individual gas molecules go in the air in front of us, we're only sensitive to kind of very large scale effects of there's an air current here or there's an air current there, not this air current is made from a trillion trillion actual, um, uh, actual molecules or something. Um, and so similarly in quantum mechanics, and this is sort of based on our very recent theories about uh, how fundamental physics works, the, you're usually not sensitive to those sort of individual threads of possible history in quantum mechanics. It's some whole bundle of threads because we are like pretty big observers of kind of the quantum world. So there's sort of a question then of how small can you get things when you have sing, sort of a single electron, it's kind of being buffeted around and it isn't the case that you can sort of identify the specific thing that happened. And so there's an issue there of how do you do computation when you sometimes can't identify the specific thing that happened? It's again, this problem of how do you connect the computation that's going on to what you can measure about the computation? Um, the, uh, so that's some, but so this question of, of uh, can you make computers faster, faster, faster? Part of that is well, what do you want to do with the computer? Can you make sort of software? Can you make computers whose hardware is optimized for the particular operations one wants to do? And then can you speed up the raw computer using a different kind of physics? Probably, because probably most of the engineering tricks over the last 50 years that could be done with semiconductors and so on, they probably haven't all been done. There probably is another, another few that can get done. But the rate of, of sort of uh, the, the rate of progress is definitely slowed down in that regard, and uh, it's it's and the effort to sort of squash out another small increase of you know ten percent in speed and so on, it's becoming a lot of effort. It's, it's a very well optimized thing. If there's a completely new technology, something operating with individual molecules or some such other thing, you can fully expect that when that first becomes available, it's like well this is cool and maybe it's fairly fast but there'll be a long period of, of you know, 50 years or more as things get gradually made more efficient and people realize, oh, if you did this and you, you know, arrange the molecule this way and you put this extra iron atom here and you do this and this and this, you can make things go much faster. That will be a gradual process of engineering improvement over some fundamental idea. But right now there isn't really a, a front and center fundamental idea that's like, yes, this is obviously going to be the next generation of what computers, of how computers are built. I mean, I, I kind of think that one of the models we have is, is biology and its way of using sort of molecules to do things for us biologically, so to speak. And I think that's sort of an indication that there are ways to do sort of uh, molecular scale computing, but we don't really know how to do that and how to set up programs, how to read out data and so on well from that, something I'm actually pretty interested in myself. Let's see, maybe um, one or two more questions here. Uh, okay, so there's a question from Saul here. If an alien civilization sent a spacecraft from uh, Proxima Centauri to Earth at the speed of light, can we detect it before it arrives? Uh, I think the answer to that is no, not in the usual 
in our usual theories of physics. So in what we believe about physics, it's only approximately true in our sort of new theories of physics. But what we have traditionally believed in physics is the speed of light is the absolute upper limit on how fast we can send a signal from here to there. And that's true for light, it goes at that speed. Gravitational waves seem to go at that speed. That is the fastest things can go. And things can go at that speed when they are massless particles. Photons seem to be massless particles. Gravitons seem to be massless particles. Other particles, neutrinos, have very uh, not quite massless. They have a tiny mass, but they go very close to the speed of light. The, the ability to go at the speed of light is something that is associated with specifically particles that don't have a rest mass. The, um, so that's sort of the fastest a signal can go. So uh, the next question is, okay, what kind of a spacecraft could you have that could go at, at the speed of light? I think the answer is, it doesn't look good. It, it's, it's one of these things where if you say, can I, could I ever go at the speed of light? You know, I have the most amazing spacecraft and I wanna go at the speed of light. Um, I think the only way you get to go at the speed of light is to be made of a bunch of photons. And we're not made of a bunch of photons, we're made of atoms. And it's something where you won't be able to get, you can get, it'll get more and more difficult as you, as you try and get closer and closer to the speed of light, the effective mass, the effective inertia increases, that's a consequence of relativity. Um, and it gets harder and harder. You have to have a, a stronger and stronger rocket engine so to speak, to push you to go faster, faster, faster. And it gets infinitely hard as you get toward at the speed of light. And at the speed of light, the only way to sort of be a successful thing traveling at the speed of light is to be a photon or some other massless particle. So in terms of can the, the alien critters go at the speed of light, actually at the speed of light, the answer is no, um, not unless they're made of photons. And it's kind of like, uh, you can imagine, I think this was the, uh, the backstory of the Star Trek transporter that it kind of uh, just turned every person or thing into pure information or something that could be transmitted at the speed of light and then it was reconstituted at the other end. It's kind of like you have a 3D scanner that goes down to the level of atoms at one end and it says, okay, this is how you're made. And then it destroys you and then it sends the data about you and it then reconstructs you at the other end. And it's sort of an interesting philosophical problem then. Is it the same you at the other end when you've been disassembled and reconstructed or not? Uh, and that's an interesting question because for example, in our current theories of physics, as we kind of move around physical space, we're made of different atoms of space. We, we get, we, we are, you know, as I move my hand, my hand seems to be this thing that stays as my hand, so to speak, but it is made of different atoms of space as it moves. It's kind of like if you're on a computer screen and you've got a little, a little you know, creature in a computer game or something, that creature stays, seems like it stays to be the same creature even as it moves around on the screen, but it's made of different pixels. And it's the same kind of thing when we're talking about actual motion of physical objects in, in physical space. So I, I think the... Um, uh, that's, that's its own issue. But as far as, you know, detecting the approaching spacecraft uh, in, uh, clearly, if the spacecraft was going below the speed of light and was emitting kind of radio signals or something, it's like, yes, we might be able to detect that. Or uh, maybe it was a, a glowing, you know, maybe it has some, some giant um, uh, flashing lights or something on it um, that uh, we could detect. Uh, which will be coming to us at the speed of light. The interesting thing, which is the thing that Einstein noticed in 1905, is that the, the, the idea is that uh, to us, the light seems like it's coming at the speed of light, but even to the aliens on the spacecraft that's going at 99% of the speed of light or something, light that you emit still looks like, looks to them as if it's going at the speed of light. So it's like the, the thought experiment is you take a flashlight, the flashlight is producing light that goes at the speed of light. You run very, very fast with the flashlight. Does the light that comes out of the flashlight in the direction that you're running come out at faster than the speed of light or just at the speed of light? If you say it always just comes out at the speed of light, which is what was implied by Maxwell's equations for electromagnetism that had come out in the late 1800s, um, if it just goes at the speed of light, then that implies that 
something funky must have happened with your notion of space and time and things like sort of the, the length of the flashlight and things like this and, the, and, and how much space you're covering uh, in each moment of time as you run and things like that. That's the only way to have it be the case that the speed of light can actually be constant. And that, that thinking is what led to special relativity. It's kind of a very kind of simple, logical and mathematical argument that shows that if you're going to have a constant speed of light, then it has to be the case that the sort of physical length of things changes when you're going faster and the elapsing of time changes its rate as you go faster and so on. Let's see, so uh, all right, there's a we got nice diversity of very different kinds of questions here. Um, let's see, maybe I'll do one more. Uh, Aaron asks, referring to two questions we've, we've addressed today. If we did have a transporter to send ourselves to another galaxy as a signal, would packet loss be a severe danger for those intergalactic signals? Um, well, you know, there isn't a lot in intergalactic space. There's maybe one atom per cubic meter at most. And we know that light from distant stars certainly does reach us here on Earth. So, things do get through the intergalactic medium just fine. And a photon that is going through a pure vacuum will just keep going. It's just a photon. It just keeps happily chugging along. If it, if it hits a, a hydrogen atom, for example, well, then it can get scattered in a different direction and it won't arrive in the right place or it might get absorbed by the hydrogen atom and emitted in a different way and so on. Um, but if, if nothing like that happens, the photons are just going to keep going. That's, by the way, a somewhat non-trivial fact when you deal with kind of our current model for what space is. In our current model for what space is, it's this giant network of kind of atoms of space at a very tiny scale where the distance, effective distance between atoms of space might be a trillion, 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 trillion trillionth of a meter across. Um, and uh, so a very tiny distance, but it's still the case that space is kind of made from this kind of giant network of these atoms of space. And the fact that we believe that there's sort of a continuous version of space where things can just move through it and where you can sort of smoothly go from one place to another, that, uh, that fact relies on kind of this continual, uh, continual changes, continual kind of um, uh, updating of this, of this underlying network in space. So it's not actually totally obvious from that point of view that a photon that is just going in a certain direction can just keep going and not get scattered in any way. And in fact, one of the things we suspect is that in the very early universe, there were probably fluctuations in the effective dimension of space-time so that space wasn't precisely three-dimensional. It might have been 3.01 dimensional or 2.99 dimensional or something. And that will affect the, the propagation of photons through, through that kind of space. So I think um, uh, there's sort of a question. Uh, the main question is if you, if you shine a very bright laser and uh, you try and get all those photons in the laser beam to go out towards some distant galaxy, will they all actually get to the distant galaxy? Well, the problem is you can't get the photons to all be lined up in direction enough to just be all be going in that direction. There'll be a certain degree of, of sort of spreading out. I think. I don't know how big they are, but I think when people shine uh, intense lasers at the moon, um, the, uh, the, they try and keep the laser light as, as concentrated as possible, but you still end up with a spot that's like a couple of kilometers across by the time it gets to the distance of the moon. So that's gonna be even broader when you get to, the, to a distant galaxy, for example. And that means that the number of photons that are going to be received will be quite small. And that, you know, it, it, unless you have some giant sort of thing that is collecting all those photons and kind of reassembling the signal that got sent, then, then you will be able to collect all the information that was sent. And I think there's one of the features of the telecommunications world that people, that, that uh, even more so than computers, people have gotten the ability to send signals faster and faster, more and more data. Um, uh, well, the signal itself will, will travel at the speed of light, 
but the amount of data that can be packed into a single, a single packet, for example, gets larger and larger um, as more and more tricks get found for doing that. And so one can imagine in the you know, advanced alien civilization that is uh, um, collecting the sort of full amount of all the photons that arrived from this laser uh, originating on Earth, it's like, okay, we know what all those bits were. Let's reconstruct, uh, let's see, Aaron, it was there, um, when, uh, when the bits arrive in the Andromeda galaxy or something. Um, but the alternative is, unfortunately, you know, not all the photons from the Aaron data arrived. Um, and so that means that the, the reconstruction can't be complete. One can always have a certain amount of redundancy. That is, you can send two photons to represent each bit, and you hope that at least one of them arrives. And there are much more optimized ways to do that, where you have kind of this whole error correcting code, where you've arranged a particular pattern of bits of data, and you've arranged to have sort of extra bits of data, and you've arranged so that the extra bits of data maximally check or optimally check the earlier pieces of data and optimally make corrections if there were, if there were errors in the earlier, uh, earlier data. But yeah, I think that the, um, the main thing is not so much the direct kind of packet loss, as just the spreading out of a signal that will cause there just only to be, you know, to be zero photons, not, not even one photon representing uh, some particular bit of information and you just can't tell anything from, from zero photons. All right, well, I think we should wrap up there. So um, thanks very much. Thanks for these questions. Please, I, I think there's a, a, a way to send in uh, questions or topics that you'd like me to try to cover. Um, and uh, then we can, be, we can be ready for another time here. And I would say that um, we'd also like feedback. I'd like feedback on uh, what things you guys find more interesting to hear about, whether the explanations I'm giving are ones you can understand because that's kind of the idea. That's the thing I find interesting is, is uh, being able to explain things that I think I understand in a way where I think other people can should be able to understand them too. Um, so I'm interested to hear about whether that's been working or not. Um, and uh, any other suggestions because we're, we're approaching the two year mark for these Q and A's and um, I'd like to know how do we best optimize them? All right, well, we should wrap up for now. And uh, um, uh, thanks. And